When I was a Protestant, I had a very strong reputation as the, as a word guy. I was quoting the scripture all the time. I had, again, I've said before in my testimony, I have a friend who used to call me Mr. Concordance for my quoting abilities and things like that. But the word was always central in everything. But I never realized until after I became a Catholic how much of the word, especially in the Old Testament, I just dismissed. Because many people don't realize that the word of God is a progressive revelation of God. It's not like God simply nullified and wiped out the Old Testament. Here's a signed document, testifying that I promise not to pull it away. It is signed. It's a signed document. I guess if you have a signed document in your possession, you can't go wrong. This year, I'm really going to kick that football. How does it all come together? Let's talk about it. Hi, welcome to The Catholic Skeptic. My name is Hugh. Glad you could join me today. We're going to talk about, well, really specifically, the specific topics. We're going to talk about the, the, the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. We're going to talk about them. It's going to take, we're not going to get through all of them. Obviously, maybe we'll get through one to start. But, uh, but we're going to talk about it in, in context of understanding certain spiritual principles that go with this. Right away, I know there are Protestants who will scream at, the, scream at their screens, Oh, the word sacrament is not even in the Bible. No, it's not. Neither is the word Trinity. The majority of you believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. All right, there are words that are not quite in the Bible. That's not the point. The thing what I want us to kind of begin with, though, is to understand how God, as I said, in his word, reveals himself. All right, talking about the word of God and, and, and confining myself in this moment just to the written word of God. Because we understand as a Catholic, you know, God's word also comes through tra- oral tradition passed down. But uh, the written word of God, there's a progressive revelation of who God is. That's one of the things that... Uh, that stands out to me is God reveals himself in his word and he reveals himself more and more progressively in the Bible. You begin to, you see him as creator. You begin to see, you know, him as lawgiver. You see the prophets proclaiming, uh, you know, you know uh, all sorts of things about his standards to the people, as well as prophesying of the coming Messiah, of his plan of salvation or redemption. Of course, the fullness of, 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 of his, of him is revealed in the word when the word is made flesh. Christ, of course, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Uh, through him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it goes on to say, in him is life, and life was light of men, and light shines in the darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. When you progress through John chapter 1, of course, you get to that pivotal verse in verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But we got this full, clear picture of who God is in in the person of Christ. And the written documents of the New Testament bear that out in so so much rich and varied in in detail that you understand more of God. But what it has been, it has been a progressive revelation of who God is, culminating in Christ. right. It's not, well, God was one way, then he changed out to another. It's not that he shifts, shifts, shifts how he does things. And, and so the more you understand about who and what God is, the more you understand what it means to walk with him. I mean, I've said many times, even in responding to the comments, you know, I see the God of the Bible does not line up to me with, the, with all what I see in the Protestant world. Because the Protestant world consists of, you know, thousands of denominations and churches and sects and groups who all teach and preach different doctrines about all kinds of things. There's uh, a massive amount of chaos, and I've done, I've done videos on this topic. <clears throat> and yet I read in the Bible of a God who does all things decently and in order, who commands us to do all things decently in order, rather, in 1 Corinthians 14. We are a God who changes not, according to Malachi 3.6. You know, a God who's revealed himself, a God who's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And I find the, 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 the loosey-goosey kind of uh, freestyle of uh, I've got me in my Bible, and that's how I know God— you know, thing not 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 settling with that. Does God's revelation in the New Testament, the New Covenant, I mean we just dismissed everything from the old? And one of the key pivotal points that we see all through the Old Testament building up is the that God always uses the physical to communicate the spiritual. All right, 
I mean, in terms of general knowledge, it's a philosophical, philosophical principle, but we always go from the known to the unknown, right? If you're going to teach anybody anything, you have to start with something they know and build from there. You know, you build from where they're at. You know, the Apostle Paul was most famous for this in the book of Acts chapter 17 when he went to Athens. His heart was stirred within him when he saw the whole city given to idolatry. And, he, and, he, and, he, and so he, he gets up in this in, in Aerogopagus, the Mars Hill area, and he begins to, to, to preach to them. And, and he says, I saw amongst all of your, your statues of one platform, a blank one that said, to the unknown God. So what you, what you were, whom you worship in ingr- ignorance, him I bring to you. And he begins to, to you know, to, to talk about this. And he quote Paul. We all know Paul quotes their poets and their philosophers. He describes things in relatable terms to what they understood, and what the Stoics and Epicureans and others would have understood from their education in in, in, in Greek culture and philosophy, combined with the scriptural revelation of of, of the of the Old Testament, and and the fullest revelation of who he is in of who Christ is. He does that progressively. You, t- you go from the known to the unknown. Well, similarly, when it comes to us, you know, in spiritual things, for 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 carnal people to start to learn spiritual things, you got to start with carnal methods. You got to you got to begin to reveal yourself in this manner. And God always uses the physical to communicate the spiritual. This is just a both in in, in his own metaphor and in in the in creation and all of that. The spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. The spirit of God, you know, you can you can see so many things that, that with the physical creation itself. You know that God saw everything that He made, all that He made, and behold, it was very good. You know the the whole picture of the the garden. You know the garden of Garden of, of Eden. You know every tree was good for food, food and beautiful to the eye. All of the fruits and the other other trees were good for food, pleasant to the eye. And so, when you think of uh, the temptation that uh, Satan through the serpent begins brings to Adam and Eve later, of, of um, you know, the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it, as 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 the temptation began to to enter into their hearts, you know, as they well, I saw the tree was good for food and uh, and pleasant to the eye, and it was a tree to be desired to make when make men wise. You know the the whole sort of temptation of this tree. I've got to have this one tree that's forbidden. When in, in reality they had so many variety of trees that were there. Got in other words, beauty, and taste, and um and and and, and pleasantness as well as you know the flavors of foods. All the, all those things God had ordained and established. God created a very sensory world, and He uses sensory things to communicate that which is beyond the senses. All right. So God did this continuously, and we see this all all all, all through redemption. You know, we, the, 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 there's a continuous need for this. You know, when Abraham is being called by God to 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 go into a land that he should afterwards inherit as as he goes from place to place you can see it in the book of in the book of Genesis from chapter 13 on and chapter 12 on but you know he continuously you know he's building an altar making sacrifice he's always bringing an altar he worshiped the Lord with an altar and sacrifice altar and sacrifice were physically a part of things when God delivered the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt you know you know he he spoke to Moses uh, you know and called to Moses from the burning bush, you know, a bush that was uh, on fire yet not consumed. And God called him. And then when Moses got near, he said, remove thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where thou standest is holy ground. So there was a, this is holy ground now. We can't play around with this. This is holy ground. And you have to take the ground of this of, of this area very, very seriously. This is a sacred place. So there were sacred spaces, sacred places, sacred objects. God calls Moses to... Um, to bring the word of God to the people. He talks about signs and wonders and, and when Moses, how am I gonna what am I gonna do? And he said, What is that in your hand? A rod. Take that rod, and with this rod you will do signs. And so the rod of Moses became a, a methodology for doing signs. Not only the signs that w- when he came to Pharaoh, the throwing it down to turning into a serpent, and then the magicians trying to imitate it with their turning into serpents, and, and Moses the serpent the Moses rod became eats and consumes theirs and touching of, of, of the water, so they turn to blood. There's all these physiological things that take place, these miracles that take place, these supernatural, inexplicable things that happen, but they're done through the method of a physical object. Later on, God commands Moses to build something that we all know is the Ark of the Covenant. All right. You see this 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 box that's made of wood but overlaid roundabout within and without with gold, you know, and, and there's specific design features that are, are to be a part of this. In the mercy seat with 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 the for, forgive me, Protestants hate it when I say it, but the graven images on top. Graven images? No, God forbids graven images. Again, a graven image is just a fancy word for statue. And God commanded that statues be made of two angels with faces facing each other. And it was from in between these two statues of angels that the presence of God would manifest. Furthermore, what what as as the children of Israel embarked, ultimately, what 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 became the thing that the ark carried inside of it? 
they had you had a, a a pot of manna that was placed in there. How God fed the people, and you see the the copies of the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets of Moses were placed in there. So the Word of God was in there, and you also had Aaron's rod that budded, which implies the whole importance of the authority in the Old Testament of the priesthood, and that uh, the various tribes of Israel had laid out laid out their their rods together because there was a big there was always a constant struggle with authority that was being challenged by re- rebellion against Moses. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in the book of Numbers describe the time where they, they come to Moses and they say, you know, you take too much upon yourself for all these people are holy. In other words, we can hear from God as much as you can. Who are you, Moses, to do this? And Moses, of course, called in the, in the Old Testament, the meekest man on the face of the earth, would fall on his face and pray when this kind of thing would happen. He wouldn't just lash out. He would cry out to God. You know, and, and when God ultimately brings sort of all kinds of judgments and testings on, on these rebels, and, and, and even after incredible, mind-blowing, supernatural things take place, there's still a rebellion against Moses. And finally, they take all of the tribes of Israel and place their rods together, uh, and, 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 the one, and the one that, uh, that, that buds or whatever is fruit will be, will be the one that uh, God has chosen. And of course, Aaron's rod is the rod that budded. Of course, it not only budded, but it had leaves and it had... It had almonds growing on of it uh, on it as well. Supernaturally, life comes to this this rod, and so that rod of Aaron's that budded, which symbolizes spiritual authority, priestly authority, together with the word, the written word of God and the Ten Commandments, and 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 Aaron's rod. But this become these become the things that are in placed inside of the ark. But my point is here: it's objects, objects, objects. We know that God's a God of ritual and ceremony, that ceremony and ritual are part of of humanity. They're a part of every human culture on the planet. They're part and parcel to all of us. You know, and, 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 and this is why I think it's fascinating, you know, when I was myself a, a Bible thumping Protestant and, um, and, and I see it from the common thing, you know, there's always that, oh, graven images, you have graven images, you have this and that, you have rituals and ceremonies. And the same people who say this go to one of their weddings. Bride sits on one side, groom's family sits on the other side. Uh, there are rings, you know, wedding rings to symbolize the covenant, which come out of the pagan world. There's various ceremonies, unity candles and different things that are done. There's a great ritual. There's ritual when you have a child's birthday party. Why is that there's a cake and there's candles? And even though, you know, a lot of hardcore fundamentalist Christians, well, I don't wouldn't believe in making wishes, they'll, they'll, be, they'll have the child pray before they blow out the candles. But there's all, you still go through the ritual and sing the same song in the ceremony. And, oh, happy birthday to you. This, is, this kind of thing goes on because human beings are geared toward ritual. And so God Almighty, who changeth not, or establish great ritual, great ritual and ceremony for everything. There are details to be done. The Passover meal, how much was was, was placed in that? Read, go through Exodus, read the account of the Passover, what had took place and what was to be done as a perpetual celebration that was going to continue on. You know, and, and, and this is where remembrance comes in and the, and the, and the kind of seriousness of, of, of celebrating the Passover and what it's about and how, how, how the, the, the father would, would, or the son rather would say to the father, why, why do we do this, father? And the, son, and, 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 the, and the father would repeat to the son, well, when we were in bondage in Egypt, and he goes through that whole spiel, not, not when they were, but we, he identifies himself in a timelessly with that time. But the point is, all of, there's a constant thing, you know, when, 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 when God chose to heal um, uh, when when uh, Nahum the, the Syrians uh, was had leprosy and and, and the servant went to uh, his servant went to went to find the prophet Elisha and and, and find out what done what were the Elisha's instructions go dip in the river Jordan for seven times so in the seventh night say dip in the river seven times you'll be healed of your leprosy and there's even a protest on the part of Nahum for why do we have to do this or that and, and how the servant has to tell Nahum. <laughs> Name it is it look if he told you to do something complicated you'd do it well, why is this the thing but there, there's still a ritual involved in, in in the healing that takes place for him God is a god of a ritual and God is a god of ceremony God is a god of using the physical objects to portray it and so we get to the fullness of the New Testament in Christ who came to bring us life and life abundantly the one who came to save us from our sins the you know the one the, the one who delivered us from our sins all we came to do in the process was just it's just a by faith thing no god has established a church all right god established a church jesus never talked anywhere to his disciples about well i'm going to send you a book later by various authors and you're going to collect this book and put all these books together a collection of books 27 of them they're going to go in you keep them in a tent somewhere and you always check that when you want to find out what somebody's right or wrong no he didn't talk about that ever what jesus did say is who do men say that i am 
And when Simon, his apostle, says to him, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, the other ones gave rumors. He said, you are rock. You know, and on this rock, I'll build my church. That's, and that is exactly how it is, is, it is both rendered in the Greek and as well as how it was actually spoken in Aramaic, which is the language they were really speaking at the time. And I'm going to give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be on heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He established a church, a living church. We as Catholics believe, of course, that, 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 that God gave us seven sacraments. But these sacraments are the means of grace. These are the transmission. The word sacrament is defined as an outward sign of an inward grace. Again, a physical outward sign to communicate. Now, again, well, we don't need that, but we have Jesus. We're, we're set free. It's all by faith. Why would God do all of these things in the Old Testament? Why would he give them such a, a visual and auditory and, 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 and sensual that with the nose as well, sight, sound, smell. Why would he do all of these things in such incredible detail and say, okay, now in the New Testament, we just throw it all out. Canceled. It's no longer a part of it. Now it's just going to be you picking up your own scroll of, of Bible passages and you read those and you believe by faith and it's all dum dum dum. Human beings have a, st- have a need for all these things, and God used them to communicate in, in, in his plan of salvation. And, he sh- and, he, and even in the New, Old and New Testament, he used types and shadows you know, to describe this. You know? In 1 Corinthians um, chapter 10, when he talks about the, the children of Israel coming out of, uh, uh, out, of, um, out, of bo- out of bondage, how they went through the waters, and that, that, that going through that deliverance was... You know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not have you be, should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And look at verse 2. It's very interesting. It says, verses 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all eat of the same spiritual meat, and they did all drink of the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. I hear the brethren screaming, Rock, the rock is Christ. Again, there's no rule in the Bible for one metaphor to one thing. All right. Yes, Peter is the rock. Yes, Christ is the rock. In Isaiah 51, I, I, Abraham and Sarah are actually called the rock. There's the, God can use different illustrations for the same thing. But the point is they ate, they drank, they were baptized. He describes this, this thing, this, this constant fulfillment in the Old and the New Testament, and that's the case. Right? God establishes these things. And he established seven sacraments that would transmit the grace of God to us. Now, seven uh, we'll get into more detail on that probably in the next part of 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 of, of, of this little series we're going to do. But you know, you just go through the Book of Revelation. Look, if you want to just do your, have fun with your concordance or your ESO or whatever, look up the word seven, the the number seven, and see how much is referenced in the in the Book of Revelation alone. God, seven is very important to God. That God thinks he's in sevens all the time. There's it's it's a it'll my, my it'll blow your mind. But God established sacraments to transmit grace. The first one, of course, the one the, the sacrament of initiation is baptism. Yes, baptism is matters. Well, baptism is just a symbol. Well, that's not what the Bible says. In in First Peter chapter three in verse twenty, he talks about uh, those who were disobedient. He said he talks in verse eighteen how Christ also hath also once suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. My dispensationalist friends out there always think that Peter didn't understand the gospel or the cross. Well, he didn't use the word cross here, but he describes Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he preached the, unto the spirits that were in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. When once the long suffering, verse twenty, of, of of God waited in the days of Noah, while was it, while the ark was appearing, wherein a few that his eight souls were saved by water, the like figure where unto even baptism doth also this is verse twenty one the like figure where unto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism saves us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People say, oh, Christ saves us. Well, of course Christ saves us. But the method he used to convey and transmit that miraculous thing called the new birth was baptism. And that's what he talked about when he in the first place. In, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, starting in verse 18, Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, he says, and this is the Great Commission now. Go ye therefore, Jesus' words, and teach all nations. So we know this is not just referring to the Jews. It's not just a message to the Jews. It's not this sort of racial bifurcation that, 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 that the, uh, the, the extreme dispensationalists seem to have, where you know Peter's, Peter was the apostle of the Gentile to the Jews and Paul the apostle of the Gentiles. Well, yes, that's true. Commission-wise, they did do that. It doesn't mean they were preaching a different gospel, though. It doesn't mean it was a different message of salvation. And Jesus told the apostles, the Great Commission, go into all, 
All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The next thing he says is baptizing them. Baptizing them, yeah, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. <gasps> commanded, yeah, commanded. And though I'm with you always, even at the end of the age, end of the world, end of the age. Christ told the, the disciples, his first apostles to do this. This was their commission. This is the commission of the church. You know, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost and they asked him around Acts chapter 2, verse 38, what must we do to be saved? In verse 38, chapter 2 of Acts, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the, rem for the remission of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. No, well, that's just for the Jews. That was a separate gospel to the Jewish people because it was Jews who were preaching to it. Well, then why does it say in the same chapter, as you read down toward the end of it, and God added to the church daily such as should be saved? He didn't say God added to the uh, remnant of those in Israel who would repent and be in Israel, Israeli Christians. You should No, it was for everybody. He added to the church daily such as should be saved. All right. See, Peter's the apostle to the Gentiles, but the first people who, who were preached to in Acts chapter 10, who, I mean, Peter's the apostle to the Jews, rather, to the, uncircumcision, to the circumcision, and yet the first uh, group of Gentiles, Cornelius of the uh, centurion, Roman centurion of the Italian band who came in with his family, were, were the first Gentiles were preached to by Peter at the direct commission of God who revealed it to him. All right, think about that. Conversely, where did Paul spend his time in the first part of his ministry in the book of Acts? In the synagogues, reasoning and teaching in the synagogues. Then he went on later to go on to the Gentiles. It doesn't mean he was carrying a different message to the Gentiles. And again, this is the problem with all forms of processism. Dispensationalism has, has this problem in the most extreme way I've ever seen, the Darbyist, the dispensationalists out there. But with all of processes is the idea that God just changed everything. It's like he took the Old Testament and said, oh, psh, no, we're, we're done with that now. We have this whole new way of doing things. You know, the book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and verse 6, tells us that we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Better, 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 better. Not just new or different. He didn't say we have a different covenant established upon different promises, but a better covenant. You know, as I've, I've used this illustration before, it was used when I was in Protestant Bible school. But why is a $20 bill better than a $10 bill? Answer, because it has the 10 in it plus more. So God continues the revelation of himself. He reveals himself. Just as in, you know, you, you, you memorize prayers. Jesus said don't use repetition. No, Jesus said do not use vain or empty repetition when you pray. That's how he phrased it. All right. In the same passage, he taught, uh, taught the disciples what we, what we in Catholic Church call the Our Father. You say, well, it was just a manner of prayer because Matthew says just manner of prayer. Well, no, Luke's gospel, chapter 11, right at the beginning, when the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples, what was Jesus' response? He said, when you pray, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yeah, he told them to pray the prayer. So it is a prayer. It was taught as a prayer. Go to the Revela book of Revelation, chapter 4, and you see but the angels and the, and, the, and the 24 elders who are human beings in heaven praying and crying out to God the same thing day and night all the time. Though over and over they were setting the same prayer. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. Over and over again. Repetition. Monotony. Ritual. Ceremony. Yes, that's a part of who God is. And when God chose to save men, he used a tangible thing called water in baptism. It was by faith. Well, of course it's by faith, but it's still, a, it's not just a, a dead symbol. It's a serious thing. So, but the word sacrament is on the Bible. The word sacrament comes in the Latin sacramentum, and it means a vow. Scott, Dr. Scott Hahn talks about this at great length in one of his books. Uh, the sacraments is really excellent. But he does about look, you, know, you have a relationship. And he uses the example of his wife. He says, my wife and I were, you know, we were dating, we were spending time together, and we began courting, so we began to fall in love, then, then, the, then there was a proposal, we became engaged, and then we got married. He goes, well, what do you do when you, we, 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 at the marriage ceremony? You exchange vows, you take a vow. Well, a sacrament is like a vow, but what does that have to do with it? It has to do with a relationship. See, it's all about our relationship with God. It's all about our relationship with God, and the sacraments are about our relationship with God. So baptism initiates that initial relationship. 
here. It's established when sanctifying grace is poured into the soul. When one is truly saved and made a new creation in baptism. That's why, again, First Peter uh, three twenty one says, "Baptism doth now save us. We are saved by baptism." Acts chapter twenty, chapter twenty two, and verse sixteen. When the apostle Paul is himself uh, re- recounting his own testimony. He says that the man named Ananias who came to him, to minister to him, and baptized him, said, Be baptized, washing away your sins. Baptism washes away sin. It is not simply just a ceremony. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, when Philip, who was ministering in an evangelistic ministry and preaching the gospel, there's a point where where where, the, where God communicates to Philip that he's to go join this chariot. He sees this chariot, and there's an Ethiopian person who is a servant, a eunuch, and a servant of the court of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. Is in a reading a scroll, and the Lord tells him to go join yourself to this chariot. So Philip asks if he can join him, and comes up into the chariot with the driver, and the driver is looking at the and reading through the a scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he asks him, says, you know, Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And interestingly, the, the, the eunuch answers, he says, how can I accept some man guide me? Someone explain it to me. How would I know unless it's explained to me? Again, this is why the folly of private interpretation in the Protestant notion. You know, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 tells us that no prophecy of scriptures is of any private interpretation. And by the way, the word prophecy there just means utterance. They say, that's just talking about prophecies. Well, first of all, Hardly, because the Protestants all over the world have end times books up, coming up the wa- up, uh, uh, your wazoo that are filled with, you know, constant references to what's going to happen and trying to line up all the headlines to, to Bible prophecy. But the point is, it's an utterance. Any utterance, anything the Scripture says, is not of any private interpretation. It goes on to say, "Holy men of old spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost." It's not a human thing. Is that just going to be humanly interpreted? But the but I digress. The, the eunuch says to him, "I need to explain it." So it says Philip began in that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So far, so good. And he said, "Yeah, he's witnessing the gospel to him." But then, what strange thing happens? They're riding along together in the chariot as he witnesses, and apparently they come by a body of water, a lake, a pond, a river, whatever. They come by water, and the eunuch says to Philip, "Hey, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized?" And of course, Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Yes, faith's there. But why would the eunuch have brought that up? All the years that I pastored a church, all the years I was involved with evangelical ministry, when we went a witnessing and sharing the gospel, right down to the very people who were going out from my uh, from the church I pastored and preaching on the streets, nobody was ever talking about baptism. Water baptism was was a, was a, got, maybe occasionally got honorable mention, and it was always reduced to nothing more than something you do after you're quote saved. It was not important; it didn't matter to people. And yet, f- yet the eunuch brings it up to Philip. So apparently, Philip, in the process of preaching the gospel to the eunuch, must have talked to him about baptism. All right, he talked to him about water baptism. So it matters. Here's water. What does it mean for being baptized? I had one guy who was always saying, "What's he talking about? The baptism of the spirit." Well, obviously, the eunuch pointed out water. So water matters. It baptismal mat water matters. It, it does make a difference. And again, I've already showed several scriptures about that. It washes away sin. It remits sin, the Bible says. It saves us. Baptism is a sacrament of initiation. It's something that brings you into the church and into Christ. But you baptize babies. Why shouldn't baptize babies? Now, that would actually be a disputable point amongst many of those who you call yourself born-again Christians. There's plenty of you, like R.C. Sproul and others, the who believe in baptism in a Protestant perspective, too. But understand this. Baptism is described in both the book of Colossians and the book of Romans as the fulfillment of of the Old Testament practice of circumcision, the sign of the covenant, circumcision. Obviously, it was for, for baptism, unlike unlike circumcision, was for both men and women. But the point is, it's an, it's an, it, it is it is the sign of the covenant. It is used as a fulfillment of that. Well, when was a when was a when was a, a young Jewish child circumcised? When he was eight days old, an infant. But who exercises faith? Well, the parents do. But again, this is where the grace con- concept breaks down for Protestants because many Protestants, again, see, you all see the pro- grace as a static thing. Boom. There's my grace. Got it. I'm saved now. Done. It's all settled. You know, you are saved. But the Catholic Church, again, talks about sanctifying grace. It's funny, it doesn't use the word justifying, although justification is in the doctrine of baptism, according to Catholic doctrine, without a doubt, theologically. You can look it up in any catechism or anywhere else. But for us, us as Catholics, we don't see sanctification and justification as totally separate things. See, Jesus didn't come to save us 
from the consequences of sin as much as he came to save us from sin. He came to save us from our sins. All right, that's how his word in the Gospel of Matthew. He came to save his people from their sins. You're saved from sin. All right, so the, 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 important, the important principle of salvation is not the fact that you get saved, now you get to go to heaven, because you, go, you then go to heaven, but that rather when you get saved, heaven gets into you. You, heaven comes into you and you become more conformed to what heaven is about as you walk with the Lord. Because God's destiny for us, for ever, all of us, whatever you're calling, is actually revealed in script in, in, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he did predestinate to be conformed, this is the purpose, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So sacrament is received for that reason. But as you walk with God, you still sin, you still mess up. God establishes the sacraments to relay and produce more of that grace in your life. That grace is fluid and, and, and kinetic. It's energized. It's, it's operative in your life. It is not simply just a one-time, bam, you're in, and now it's all settled. You know, and then you just try to struggle and read your Bible and pray, and if you're a decent sort, you'll, you'll try to live holy, but according to many of my dispensational friends, in fact, one that I just was just written that I just saw a uh, comment on tonight and wrote back uh, responding to it. You know, it's like, it's one, you're in. There's nothing to do with works. It's all done. It's a settled issue. You can be holy because you choose to be holy, and that's nice, but you could also live like the devil. You can live any way you want as long as you're truly saved. You're going in. Now, not all Protestants believe that. I, I was a pastor, Richard. We didn't believe that. We took a more Calvinistic version of it, not Calvinism, purely, but a Calvinistic version of understanding that, no, that there's, if you're truly saved, there's going to be fruit in your life. So I realize more Protestants have a more common sense view of this. But the problem with that, oh, well, if you're truly saved, then there'll be fruit, and then we'll see the works in your life, is how many works and how much? How much sin is allowed? How much work? It, it, it all becomes to vary. What, what, what constitutes truly someone who's godly and growing versus someone who doesn't? And how do you measure that? So we believe God, God's grace is imparted to us, God gracing us all the time, and especially through the instrument of the sacraments, which is why Jesus instituted what we in the Catholic Church call confession. Jesus, yes, Jesus instituted confession. Jesus is the one who gave the apostles the power to forgive or retain sins. It's in the gospel, of the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Christ comes to them after the resurrection, and it says he breathed on the apostles and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. He gave the apostles the power to re remit and re retain sin. That's confession. That's what happens for us as Catholics when we go in and, 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 and confess our sins before a priest who was assessor of the apostles, who then exercises that pra prayer and, and that, that, that authority and grants us absolution from our sins. So you can be restored to a state of grace if you fall from grace. That's the point of it, because it's a progressive life. That's why he instituted the Holy Eucharist and communion. We receive the body and blood, soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, really and truly present on the appearance of bread and wine. And Jesus at length taught on this in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Lest you eat my flesh, drink my blood, he said, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, dwells in me, and I in him. Well, he was just using a metaphor. He was just using a metaphor. Really? Then why does it say in the same chapter? And I've done already videos on this. I'm not going to rehash all of the details of it right now. Why does he say in the same chapter? It says, when Jesus taught this, the crowd was stunned and shocked and offended. He said he lost disciples. Many walk, went back, it says, of his own disciples, his own followers, and walked no more with them because they were so offended by this teaching. If Jesus was using a metaphor, don't you think he would have said, hey, wait, guys, let me explain to him. I'm just giving you a teaching illustration here. You're not actually going to eat any flesh or drink blood. Yeah, you are. Communion was instituted for that purpose, to receive truly and holy his body, blood, soul, and divinity. It was like, well, we believe it's spiritually receive it. Well, you do spiritually receive it. It is spiritual too, but it also involves eating and, and, and drinking. It involves physically partaking of that, of that sacrament. We've talked about this before that, you know, the, the, you know we, we're, we, in our society, we're so hung up on the word literally, literally. It's literally this or literally that. And I know people freak out about that because they think, well, you're preaching cannibalism. Are you, are you, when you're taking, receiving Holy Communion, are you chewing blood and bone and, and fingernails and, and bits of liver or, 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 or heart or, or brain matter or, or eyelashes? I mean, you, you can get real gross if you think about it. Because you're thinking literally. What the Council of Trent said in, in defining this document fully was 
you truly receive the body and blood, soul, and body. Not literally, but truly. In other words, it's truly his body and blood, soul, and body, but it remains in the appearance of the bread and the wine. It talks about the accidents and the substance. That the substance has changed, but the accidents, the physical appearance, the matter of appearance, remain the same. Yet there are in the Catholic Church the Eucharistic miracles. Many miracles have been recorded and documented where it has actually become flesh where they've actually done DNA testing and there's physical flesh there. There's some tremendous miracles that occasionally do take, take place the, the, in that manner. All right. Why? To testify of this truth over and over again. But the, again, what's the point? To, to feed and to feed on his body and blood, receive his life and continuously allow that life to flow into you and to cause you to grow. The sacrament of confirmation, receiving of the Holy Spirit, as you see all through the book of Acts, when the apostles would lay hands on someone, they receive the Holy Spirit after they'd believed. A sealing. There are marks on the soul of a human being as a result of that. From ba- baptism, confirmation, holy orders, the Catholic priesthood. Oh, that's not in the Bible. There's, no person. There's all kinds of examples all through the Bible of the passing on through the powering through the laying out of hands. All right, so yes, it is, it is a very powerful and very clear teaching in Scripture. But again, we'll get into that farther as we go through some of these different seven, magnificent seven sacraments that we're going to talk about here. But I want you to understand the reality of these things, that there's grace involved, that it's supernatural. It's something God's ordained and established. Not only that you save, but that, you, that frankly you stay saved, that you grow in the grace and knowledge of God. And why? Because we are tangible people. We are human beings who have flesh and blood. We have... Uh, sensory organs. We have all these things where, you know, that, that which is tactile and physical, that which is olfactory involved with the sense of, of the sense of smell, that which is involved with, 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 with touch, with the kinesthetic touching and, and auditory and visual elements of our lives. Yes, we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. We walk by faith, always by faith. But God helps carry us along with, in our senses by, the, by, by the, these things. That's why, again, Going to church as a Catholic, I, I get to enter into a holy place that looks like a holy place where I can see holy things where candles are lit and there's stained glass and there's statues and there's all sorts of things to, to, to communicate holiness and purity to me. Whereas I pastor a church where it basically looks like it's an auditorium with a plexiglass pulpit and you just stand on the pulpit behind the podium and preach and teach and it's all just about the preaching and teaching and that's it. Except for a little cracker and grape juice thing once a month. God wants us to have this in his in our lives. Uh, the life of a Catholic is so much more confident when you when you're on fire God. and you might know i've met you know three dozen dud catholics who, who were raised in it don't walk in it and say oh i've got catholics they don't know anything yeah, and i've talked to evangelicals who are idiots as well because guess what both idiot Protestants and catholic churches have idiots in them all right that's just a reality but the sacramental graces are amazing and when you exercise your faith and understand what's happening it changes your life so much it empowers you to walk in holiness in ways you never could imagine and to know the presence of God in deeper ways than you could possibly grasp. Because it's Jesus' church, the one he established and ordained these things of. Oh, yeah, but things like the real presence of Jesus, that wasn't defined until the fourth letter in council, the 1200. No, that's when there was a definition of tr- the term transubstantiation was coined and used to describe in some way this miracle that takes place. But you can go back to uh, the, 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 the letters of, of Ignatius of Antioch writing in the, in the early 2nd century who was himself the disciple of the Apostle John who talks about unless you acknowledge this, the flesh of, 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 of this bread is the flesh of Christ, you don't belong to him. So it's taught right from the beginning. Always taught right from the beginning. The reality of that. Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It is the New Testament in my blood. And I love, again, Dr. Scott Hahn's phrase, Catholic theologian, former Protestant, who, who always says it this way, that the New Testament was a, do- was a sacrament before it was a document. But the term sacrament is coined to describe this power of relationship that comes when grace is transmitted. But God gave us a whole pattern all through the Old Testament of this physical reality that, would be, be, that God uses to communicate spiritual things. He didn't stop doing that. That's the point of John 1.14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus became a man. God took on you. A spirit was wedded to matter. Eternity entered into time. Grace came onto, into nature. God became a man. 
this is the miracle of the of the incarnation. We're coming in for as this, at the taping of this, we're we're we're, we're close to Thanksgiving, coming into the Christmas season, the Advent season, the commemoration of, of Christ's birth. Many say, well, that more the real more important one, even you know, even in the Catholic Church, we consider Easter the, the higher holy day, so to speak, the rec- recognition of Christ's resurrection, celebration of his resurrection. But understand this. The celebration of Christmas is also a celebration of the incarnation, the, of incarnate, that, God, that Christ is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, one in being with the Father, that he, that through him all things made, and for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Not reincarnate, incarnate. He, and became man. He had entered into human flesh. God knows you have flesh. God knows just the Romans says in our flesh dwells no good thing, but God ministers to us through that. He said in the book of Acts, I'll, in the last days I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. He knows we have flesh. That's a reality of it. He understands our weakness. Read Psalm 103. He talks about that in there. He knows of our flesh. He understands it. This is the goodness of God. This is the grace of God. This is the ministry of God. And the sacraments are part of that. They are magnificent. They are awesome. They are phenomenal. Life in the sacramental world is so wonderful. Living without that sacrament, it's hard to say the case. For instance, as a Catholic Church, yes, we believe that water baptism is valid if it's done in the proper manner, the Trinitarian formula, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit with water, that that's a valid baptism. And so, yes, if, if, if you as a child or adult were baptized, you had sanctifying grace poured in your soul. You're initially saved or a child of God. But the thing is, you don't have confession. You don't have that opportunity to go and receive absolution. Now, does that mean God can't forgive without absolution? No, God can God can do whatever he wants. God is not bound by it. It's like the old uh, joke I saw in a movie once. Just so, because a king forbids his subjects to wear a crown doesn't mean he can't wear one himself. God can choose to do whoever he wants to do with you. All right? And God in his, the Bible, the Catholic Church teaches that if a person is truly, truly has perfect contrition as a Christian, they will, they can receive absolution without going to confession. But I don't know if I've ever experienced perfect contrition in my life. I'm not going to chance that or, or, or rest on it or hope it's the case. You know, in in the uh, uh, you know, uh, we've had I've had discussions with, with 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 people becoming Catholic over this. Many times, when people come out of the evangelical world, they say, "Well, yeah, well, I was in the evangelical world. We were told, wow, you're saved, you're all set.' In the Catholic Church, we don't know if that's the case. We don't know if we're certainly saved or not. Listen, when I was a Protestant pastor, I ministered to dozens and dozens and dozens of people who were always tormented, not knowing whether they're truly saved or not. Picking out a few hand-picked, cherry-picked verses out of context to try and assure someone of their absolute certainty of salvation doesn't work. Because they're always going to doubt it. Yet I can go into the confessional and confess my sins and know for sure that I have received absolution from a genuine priest who was ordained through ministers who were successors of the apostles. That that's a genuine grace. And that I've received that and come out feeling fresh and clean. It's awesome. It's tremendous. It's a spiritual experience. It's, it's incomprehensible to explain until you, you, you understand and been there. But it's wonderful and it's certain. Or you can rely on your own wits and your own grasp of the Bible versus your reading and hope the ones that you picked out are the right and those ones that bother you, well, try to slide those aside. If you're dispensationalist, you can say it's for some other group, not for us. But the rest of the Protestants, we have to say, well, the context is... Jesus established a church and he instituted grace through transmitted through sacraments. And it's ideally excellent for you to have the sacraments in your life on a regular basis. There's no substitute, you know, like the old commercials. There ain't nothing like the real thing. You want the reality of the sacrament of baptism. You want the reality of the sacrament of penance, confession. You want the reality of the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. And receive him. You want to be confirmed, to have confirmation. The Holy Spirit in a greater and stronger measure in your life. You want to know that marriage is just sacrament. That marriage is not a light thing. Marriage is a wonderful and awesome thing. As a married man, I have a sacrament. There's a sacramental grace that my wife and I have. It's an amazing and awesome thing. There's a grace of God that comes from that sacramental thing that is a, an indissoluble union and bond. There's something more, way more powerful when you understand as a sacrament, not just a legal contract you made once. It's just a piece of paper, a legal contract. No, it's a holy sacrament and a means of grace in your life. And that God has set aside certain individuals just to be ordained in holy orders to administrate those sacraments. God is good. The anointing of the sick. The grace that's present in that in that sacrament. Not just the fact that we're anointing someone with oil and praying with them or healing, which we are, but or which the priest is, but it's also the tremendous reality of the grace that's transmitted at that time, especially if the person's close to death. God's established it. 
what he talked about in James, what of any sick that I'm called for the elders of church, knowing the loyal name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven him. It's interesting. I've never said how evangelicals deal with that verse in James because, well, I've already forgiven past, present, future. I'm born again. And James says, if any sick among you believers, call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The sick will the sick Christian. And the Lord will raise them up. And if he's committed any sins, yeah, they'll be forgiven. This is part of the, re- the reality of what the sacraments are. It is a tremendous thing. It is a tremendous liberty. It's something to celebrate and be excited about. God has so much more for you, especially to my Protestant friends that watch. He has so much more for you than just me and my Bible. I'm just going to read my Bible and believe. Because again, it is the church that gave you the Bible. There was no complete New Testament assembled. They were written in the first century. Amen, hallelujah. But they were not assembled and established until later years by the church. So three, almost four centuries later in church councils where they were established and established and, and, and as a New Testament. So every time you open this book and you read the New Testament, you are giving a tacit acknowledgement that the church has told you this is scripture. Because otherwise, how would you know? Well, I just bears witness with my spirit. I know inside. Really? Well, the Mormons say the same thing about how to know the Book of Mormon is true. They say if you read the Book of Mormon, you feel a burning in your bosom. Muslims believe that with the Quran, that if the Quran is read to you, it'll make you cry. It'll be so powerful. Emotional experiences can happen. Hindus have said the same thing about the Bhagavad Gita. The thing is, emotional experiences can't be the determining factor of how I know something is risen true. And when I think about these 27 different documents that were put together and established, writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, James, Jude, Peter, Apostle Paul, John, all these were assembled and put together, and there was some dispute in the beginning of the original scripture, and they were established as scripture. Yet Martin Luther had the audacity to say, no, I'm going by the Bible alone, except for that book of James scares me. I'm not sure that's going to even be in there. Well, I'm not really sure about this one or that one later, and he struggled with that. When his translation came, he put stuck in the book of James really toward the back for that reason. Jesus established a church. The grace of sacraments are in that church. God does so much that's so clear. A good Catholic can be a wonderful example to you. Bad Catholics can be a horrible example to you. But going by, well, oh, I heard Catholics say this, or Catholics say that, or this is going on, or that's going on. So what? God has established dogma. What is dogma? Simply the, the fancy word for the revealed truth. That God has revealed. It's revelatory and truth and can't be rescinded or done. Or undone in any way. Yeah, but I think the Pope's going to change everything. The Pope can't change diddly. The Pope can't change dogma. All Popes have to conform to the dogma that's already revealed. The Pope doesn't get fresh revelation to un- overturn previous revelation. It doesn't work that way. That might be okay for the President of the Mormon Church. Some of those groups, they, they tend to believe that they, they can come up with new revelations. The Catholic Church does not teach that. There's truth that's revealed and established. Yes, the Bible, the Scripture, the Word of God. And yes, sacred tradition. Sacred tradition, the oral transmission of God's revealed truth. And yes, the magisterium of the church, cast with the authority of teaching that truth. But you say, what are you seeing? We're seeing layer upon layer upon layer, right? Like a, you know, <laughs> Shrek said, I don't know what the ogre's like an onion that's got layers. Well, you've got layers in the church, layers of truth that have been established. And there are also liars in the church, and there are heretics in the church, and there are crazy people in the church that come, they get in there and do all kinds of things. There's also holy saints and amazing men and women of God who have lived in such faithfulness and have given such testimony. The truth is the truth is the truth, but it's clear. To me, God revealed himself in the Word. He doesn't change. So if he's revealed himself of God of ceremony and ritual, and transmitting spiritual through the physical in the Old Testament, is that going to change in the New Testament? It says in the book of Acts that, that they took handkerchiefs from Paul's body and brought them to the sick, and healings took place and demons were cast out. That was went on then. All right, the physical and the spiritual. Oh, the, the, God does that. He's, he, that's the way God is. And you want to know that truth and inconstancy because, see, the revealed tr- gospel of Christ should begin from the very beginning. It should be the same gospel being preached in the 1st century, in the 5th century, in the 12th century, in the 8th century, in the 4th century, in the 17th century, in the 19th century, in the 21st century. Same gospel. doesn't change. 
Same truth, same salvation, same message, same good news of Christ. The magnificent seven sacraments that God has established. You receive grace of those. Let's hope that that will come together for us all. Anyway, that's enough for now. Please hit like and subscribe. Please keep the comments coming in, the good and the bad and the ugly. And please be a, and, pl and please hit like and subscribe. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.